Okay, welcome everyone to today's TSVP talk. Uh, today we are joined by Travis Grimshaw, who's uh, currently visiting from uh, Hokkaido University. Travis completed his PhD in 2015 at UC Davis and has since had positions at uh, University of Minnesota, University of Queensland, Osaka Metropolitan University, and now is finally in uh, Hokkaido University where he's an assistant professor, soon to be an associate professor. And uh, he's been working closely with a few of uh, the members of our unit while visiting. So we're glad to be joined by him today. And the title of his talk is Throwing Balls to Make Microscopic Waves. Oh, thank ahead. you. Thank you very much for the introduction and allowing me to be part of this uh, nice program, this uh, wonderful traveling salesman's visitors problem uh, type solution. But uh, I guess because I'm not talking to a bunch of computer scientists, no one understands that joke and I'll move along. So uh, during my talk today, I'm going to just give an introduction about some, uh, some very classical results uh, from probability theory well, not super classical, but uh, more than 30 years old. Uh, but the, the model itself actually is uh, uh, about 80 years old now. And uh, talk about the, what happens kind of in the long-term behavior and going from the microscopic level to the macroscopic level. And then I'll talk about uh, a very similar type of model but that's deterministic and that's motivated from a completely different area. And then I'll, uh, at the end of the day, just sketch some open questions and uh, you know, maybe you'll have some nice applications for uh, whatever problem that you're interested in. Uh, I mean, the, the, the model I'm gonna start with is actually a very, very widely used model in, mathematical, uh, all sorts of mathematical contexts, but also physics, chemistry, biology, traffic congestion, uh, engineering, things like that. So what it is, is known as TACEP. So this is the totally asymmetric, simple, exclusion process. So what you should imagine is you have a, just a single lane of traffic and a bunch of cars on that road. And just to save time, I'm gonna draw a car as just a dot uh, and each car on its own gets to decide, well, okay, now it's time for me to move. But of course, you never want uh, any cars to hit each other. So you get this particle here, this car, it can't move forward because there's a car already in the, in the next space available. And so, uh, this is our model, and what we have is each particle uh, weights, well, to start with, let, let's actually make this a little easier. Rather than, you know, it has a stopwatch and decides how it wants to wait, it has a coin with some bias. So I'm going to fix some real number alpha greater than zero, and I'm going to flip a coin. with probability alpha over alpha plus one of uh, telling me, so that will be my success, uh, telling the particle to move. So it's just a coin flip. And you just wait until the first time you get ahead, and then you repeat and repeat, and you at every time step, every car that can move, its driver flips a coin and goes, oh, it's heads. Now I move to the next base. 
if there's a car already in front, well, you're stuck in traffic and well, you can call it a fun game of flipping a coin, but you know you're not gonna do anything, so you might as well watch uh, a TikTok video. So uh, that, that's the, the start of the model. And so the probability of the waiting time being T is equal to uh, P to the uh, T times one minus P. Well, actually I've done it the other way. Uh, so let me, you have one minus P to the T number of failures, and then you get a probability, you get a success and therefore you move. And well, this here is basically a geometric series. You probably learned about this in high school. Uh, and if I sum, if I make this infinite sum, I get one because, well, an event should happen for sure. That's probability one. So this is our discrete time model. But when we're doing this, we actually want to do continuous time. And we want to find a way to sample this because, well, the if you have a, a continuous you know, say uh, you're picking a random number between zero and one, a random real number between zero and one, the chances of you getting exactly uh, pi over uh, three uh, minus one, let's say, is zero. There's no way you're gonna get precisely that one real number. There's just, it's too many. So uh, we need to find a way to actually model this. And so what we do, is we scale time uh, and the probability at the same rate by say some delta t going to zero. And when we do that, this probability, it goes to an exponential uh, waiting time. So what that means is I get some rate alpha e to the minus alpha t uh, becomes the probability that we have to wait. And so this idea of flipping coins uh, at the scale of the, the time step in a discrete simulation that you run on a computer, uh, we can model it. We can model this exponential waiting time in this way. And so now we have a continuous time process and that more reflects uh, what we see in the real world of actual traffic movement. But you know, if we also wanted to model uh, electrons moving down a wire or uh, blood flow in a capillary, anything where things are constrained, it basically looks like a one-dimensional problem where things move with some randomness, but some fixed rate, uh, this model gives you a way to do that. And we want to now understand what's its macroscopic behavior. What happens after we wait, say, 20 hours, rather than just, well, in the first five seconds, things like that. What, what kind of behavior should we expect? And how we're going to do that is we're actually going to change our, our picture altogether. So I'm going to simplify this a little bit more. And I'm going to start with all of my particles at base, all of my cars basically at a traffic light. So if you want, you can think of this as some kind of like capacitor and then it's released, it's discharging its, uh, its uh, electrons and moving down the wire and of course, you know, as one particle moves, another one needs to eventually get to the wire and things like that. So this is our starting condition. And then, well, after some amount of time, then our particles, we have our special zero spot here. And our particles will move 
along to say some points here, here, Three, one, two, three, like this. And what we do is we will draw this tilted square grid. And I'm sorry for my very poor drawing skills here. And from that point, what we do is we just say, well, this first row here is how far the first particle moves. So the first particle here is moved one, two, three, four time step, uh, four steps. The second particle has moved two time steps. This third part, uh, sorry, two steps. The third particle has moved one step. And then the rest of the particles are still stuck over here. And so I get a figure that looks like this. Maybe what I'll do is I'll color in another color here. All of the positions of my holes. So basically what it comes down to is the steps that go down correspond to the position where there's a particle and the steps that go up correspond to a hole. And this uh, shape that I get is known as a partition. Like that. And so this is good. Uh, cause now we get something that actually starts looking like a function. It's piecewise linear. It goes one step down, one step up, and we just kind of chain those together. But as we start to scale out bigger and bigger and bigger, and we rescale everything so that, uh, after say T time steps, the, um, we just scale it so that the the things that we can see actually lie between zero and one. And we can see that there's going to be you know, clearly less than T particles that move. Then the shape that we get, it looks a little jagged, but it starts getting closer and closer to an actual smooth curve like this. And what we want to do is we actually want to describe what that curve is precisely. So now we have our model, but our model is still just a little bit complicated. And when we're in continuous time as well, two particles will basic will never move at the same time. Again, the chances of you picking a random number between zero and one, that's exactly uh, pi over three minus one is zero. So let's actually tweak our model a little bit and say, well, only exactly one particle moves at each time step. So we only, you know, we're, we're kind of forgetting about time a little bit. And we're just saying, well, we only care about the, the sequence that the particles move. And we, therefore, you know, again, only one particle moves every single time. We just record that. And so we record that uh, in the um, boxes of the partition. So, you know, again, the partition is cut out from this uh, square grid. And so I get a bunch of boxes. And now I'm going to fill those boxes with integers one, two, three, up to however many boxes I have. 
but I can't do this in an arbitrary order. I basically need to play a big game of very simple Tetris where one block drops at a time and it slides down into a corner. And so if I want to do an example, say here's my uh, partition shape. Well, the, very the only particle can, that can move is the very first particle at the first time step. But now we have a choice. We can move the first particle again or move the second particle. So let's say I move the first, then the second particle moves, and then the second particle moves again. First particle moves, first particle moves, then the third particle, then the first particle, then the second particle, and then the fourth particle like this. And these are known as uh, standard Young Tableau. So now our model is basically we want to actually count the number of standard Young Tableau. So I'll write that as F lambda. This is the number of standard Young Tableau. However, it turns out that if I want to properly encode the, the, the dynamics of my original particle system with that rate alpha that I originally started with, I don't quite want F lambda by itself. I actually want the probability of the particles being at a position lambda being equal to F lambda squared. And then I need to normalize that. And there's a few questions involved. First, does this make sense? Can this normalization constant be infinity? And therefore, everything is 0, and then things uh, go bad. Well, I want to actually th make things just a little bit easier, because it will go to infinity, and things are bad. So let's normalize this. But let's only do it where the, the size of the partition, the number of boxes of the partition, is equal to a fixed value n. And then we just take n off to infinity because n is our time. Maybe I should actually call it t for that matter. Because it's you know how many steps have we done? And we want to take time off to infinity and then rescale. So uh, basically, I want to take a sequence of random partitions where one's contained inside of the other. And that's how I'm kind of encoding recording these tableau. And so uh, from this, now I need to actually, I can compute uh, ZT because I know I have a finite sum. I can, I want to compute the sum of F lambda squared. This will be my ZT, where I'll just throw a little bit of math notation here, but I'm just summing over all partitions of T, all ways to uh, put these boxes, put T boxes. And so the claim is that this is equal to T factorial. In other words, this is the number of ways of uh, shuffling uh, T cards. And how do we see that? Well, we have a nice way to do that. And I'll just draw yet another grid. And I think this is square. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And well, the number of ways of shuffling T cards here in this grid, I have eight. I have an eight by eight. I have a standard 
uh, chessboard and I want to shuffle eight cards, well, the how I can encode that is by placing eight rooks on this chessboard such that none of them can attack any of the others. So for instance, I can do something like this. And so why is this a shuffling? Well, I can just write eight, six, three, five, four, one, seven, two. Say this three is coming from, well, let's say this five here. Well, it's in the fourth position, the fourth row, fifth column. That's how I can assign these. And now how do I get the standard Young Tableau out? Well, what I do is I draw straight lines going up from every point and to the right of every point such that uh, they intersect in the first possible way. Well, that's not quite right. That goes up, I'll go. Like this. And now I record one, two, seven, one, four, seven, like this. And now the next thing is I look at all of these points where they've collided, and I repeat. I'll go up and escape. I'll go like that, and I'll go up. And so now I get three, four, eight, two. And I repeat yet again. So five, three. And I'm running out of colors. And so that's six, five. And then finally, six, eight, like this. And so I started with the red and I write one, two, seven and one, four, seven. Now I take the blue, I have three, four and two, eight. Then I, next was the green. So I have five and three and the purple I have six and five. And finally, for the pink, I have eight and six. And so what we see is we get a pair of standard Young Tableau out from this process. And this gives us our bijection because well, th this, what I started with is a shuffling of eight cards, and I've given you a pair of st uh, standard Young Tableau. And now I need to show that I can go in the reverse direction. I can start with a pair of standard Young Tableau and go backwards. Well, how I do that is basically the sequence just done in reverse. I start with line coming in at eight, line coming in at six, and that creates a point there. Then I have a line coming in at six, line coming in at five, and then lines coming out at this pink point. And well, that gives me the all of the purple lines. And you can repeat that over and over again until you get uh, until you're done. And then the points that you're left with are the red points, and those are precisely your permutation, your shuffling of cards.
And it turns out that this construction is also related to something called polynuclear growth, where you have a line and uh, somewhere along that line, you, uh, a point comes into existence and then, or like imagine um, you have, uh, you know, a fire breaks out somewhere and then it spreads linearly, but spontaneously uh, you have additional fires that pop up and you may have a second fire and you record that. And that's this polynuclear growth model. And so uh, this basic, what I'm saying with this is, well, I transform the picture and I now have my normalization constant. So I now have the prob I now have an actual probability for a random partition uh, with n boxes in it. And uh, but I can also say a little bit more uh, from this that the shuffle here, if I look at um, the things, let's see, how does it go? Uh, well, basically, I look at this longest row here, and that's going to correspond to the longest increasing, yeah, longest increasing subsequence of this permutation. So uh, the three, the five, and the seven is an increasing subsequence. And this will come up, you know, why I'm mentioning this, it'll take me another moment to actually get there, but uh, please bear with me. So we now have a, a probabilistic model and it turns out we can, uh, I won't bore you with some of the details, but essentially using this idea that there are uh, particles, we can use techniques from mathematical physics to actually compute these integrals, uh, or sorry, to compute the long-term behavior by studying uh, asymptotics and uh, doing some analysis. But the, the main result is um, uh, care of, uh, sorry, Vershek. care of and independently Logan and Shep around 1986, which says that the, their theorem was that the limit shape is a semicircle. So after a really, really, really long time, if I choose a random partition with this uh, distribution, with this weighting, then what I get is something that looks basically like a semicircle. So if I you know, could draw a perfect uh, semicircle that uh, touched uh, properly, and then I sampled a random partition, it would just look, if I make n sufficiently big, even something like n equals 100, I get something that looks exactly like the semicircle here. And that's, uh, you know, the, and basically I now know the long-term behavior and how the essentially the density of particles is as I go to a macroscopic level. But we, we even know things a bit in a bit finer detail because we know what the, the limit shape is, but we also want to look at the, um, how lambda one varies from the limit shape. So we want to look at the little microscopic fluctuations of the first particle compared to where it should be. 
So the first particle, you know, we, we know how that should move. You know, it's free to move. There's no constraints. It's flipping a coin. It should follow basically this geometric distribution if we do it kind of in a, you know, we've changed our model a little bit. So things are a little bit different, but essentially, you know, that should behave very, you know, it should be very well behaved, but there's that little tiny fluctuations involved. And it turns out that uh, this distribution is equivalent to the uh, distribution of the largest eigenvalue in a random unitary matrix where we choose entries by uh, Gaussian distribution. In other words, we take, you know, basically the complex analog of the normal distribution, you know, little bump, you know, re remember back, uh, you know, standard, you know, well, actually everyone here is, I'm sure, taught a class and your students ask you about what's the standard deviation of the grades, you know, all, all of that stuff, that, that's the Gaussian, right? And so, you know, it's a, a fairly simple model for you choose half the entries and then the fact that it's transpose and complex conjugate uh, has to give you the same thing. You now have all of the entries of the matrix and then you look at its largest eigenvalue and you look how that fluctuates from another semicircle. This is known as Wigner semicircle law. As the matrix gets really big, the eigenvalues approach a semicircle and distribution uh, for value, and so, uh, and this is known as the Tracy Widom distribution. And this is not quite a normal distribution. It looks a little skewed. There's you know a little bit slower up on one part and sharper down on the other. So why is this important? Well, these random matrices, uh, the people in high energy nuclear physics, well, if you want to model these very heavy atoms and how the nucleus behaves, well, you, from what I understand, you don't want to do it directly. Instead, you take a random matrix. And essentially what I've done is I've connected just particles moving down the wire with nuclear physics. Well, I, uh, well, th this is classical results, but I'm saying that it's related. And this is um, due to bike, uh, Deft, and Johansson. I believe this is the uh, first known proof of this. And so uh, this fairly simple model, particles moving along a line, it actually has very, very rich structure to it. Not only that, but it also has other interesting macroscopic behaviors. If we add another light particle, and by this, what I mean is I have a, uh, another particle that's lighter than the original particles I started with, and those big heavy particles, well, they can just push the light particle out of the way. They treat the light particle like a hole, uh, but the light the light particle, if it has a hole, it can move, but it can't get past one of the heavy particles. And uh, this particle models uh, shocks. 
in the system. So if you want to think of it uh, like water or gas, or maybe like a gas uh, flow, you have two gases. One is lighter than the other. Uh, in a tube, you remove the thing separating them, and you look at how they mix. And say a current, well, uh, they start mixing. But what will end up happening, is, depending upon how you set your parameters, is suddenly the density changes. I mean, it starts kind of initially in the system, but there's you can get that same sort of sharp change in density as the system propagates in time. And you want to measure, well, where does that uh, shock actually move? Well, if you want to do this microscopically, this is what this light particle does. So it's just a very slight tweak of the model, but you can actually do uh, quite a bit uh, more with it. Um, it also has spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. So again, this is kind of long-term behaviors, but if you start uh, looking at different parameters, you start adding different parameters, local inhomogeneities to the system, particles can move with different independent rates you can uh, see very sudden changes in your macroscopic behavior for small uh, changes. So you get you know, all of this uh, behavior without actually having to do too much. Um, your phase transitions. Can come. From. Uh, boundary uh, conditions, sorry. And usually you see phase transitions when you start changing internal structure, changing parameters, things like that, but, you know, spontaneous symmetry breaking. But it turns out that you, rather than working on a line, you work in a finite dimensional, uh, you know, finite lattice, then your boundary uh, values can actually play a role in how the system behaves and, uh, and drastically change the macroscopic behaviors of the system. So this, this model is very, very rich. And uh, basically what's currently being studied is, um, you know, uh, uh, current studies are, on a ring uh, with inhomogeneities. So as I said, the particles can have inhomogeneity the, at different time steps, the rates could change. At different positions, the rates could change, things like that. And there's still a lot of open questions about this model at a mathematical point of view and being able to rigorously prove, well, if I just start tweaking my model a little bit, I allow particles to hop over another. They hop more than one space. Uh, they hop with different rates, all of these different things. Um, you can get uh, very different behaviors that occur and we can't actually prove them mathematically. You can run simulations. You can see lots of good behaviors, but uh, the rigorous proofs uh, are actually much harder than that. There's a lot, lot of detail that's hidden in these. And uh, was there anything else I wanted to say with this? Um, yeah, not maybe not. A well, there's, uh, these are also uh, very recently connected with uh, counting how many lines uh, pass through a 
generic uh, configuration. of lines, or more generally, k-dimensional subspaces of n-dimensional space and how they align with each other, things like that. Uh, and so th this is a, a very, you know, th this understanding, um, you know, how, how to count these things is a classical subject known as Schubert calculus. And, it's really only in the past few years that we've realized, oh yeah, the TSEP is being governed somehow by this geometry. And we go from something that's very, very rigid to something probabilistic. And we don't really understand how to go between these, what it means to, what the geomet on the geometry, the probabilistic stuff means and vice versa. So that's kind of the, the first half of my talk. Are there any, well, less than half, but let's say the first part. Any questions at this point? I'll save mine till the end. Right. Something related to this, yes. All right. So now, so that, that's the, the probabilistic side. But what if I want to make this a more deterministic process? And how we're going to do this is something called the box ball system. And this was introduced by Takahashi and Satsuma in 1990. And what you do is you again take the, the model. Now I'm going to draw it slightly differently, but it's still the same model at heart. Uh, I put a bunch of particles, like so. And then what I do is I scan from left to right. And when I encounter a particle for the first time, I throw it into the next available spot. So I take this. And this particle goes over here. Now, well, I, I move from this point to this point, but I've already seen that particle. So I continue on. I throw this particle here, continue. This particle gets thrown here. This gets thrown here. This gets thrown here. And so what I end up with is this local or this configuration. And now if I run that process again, that particle moves one step, that particle moves one step. And then this collection of three particles moves three steps, but it still stays stuck together. And what we see as we investigate this system is that uh, collections of balls move with speed equal to its size, the number of balls. In particular, this one moves with uh, speed one, this one moves with speed one, and this moves with speed three, provided they're far enough apart. Here, they're kind of in this interacting process. Mainly these four here are interacting with each other. And so we get, um, you know, at that point, we can't really see what's going on. But when they're far apart, they move with speed equal to their size. And, um, they uh, keep their same size after interaction. And so 
we call these solitons. So why do we do that? Well, if you like to study waves and thin channels, you've probably come across the Kotwig de Fries equation, or KDV, if you uh, want, if that's uh, if uh, speaking Dutch war, uh, names is way too hard for you, it it is for me. Um, so I usually call it the KDV equation. And uh, so this is a partial differential nonlinear equation. And the solutions for this are something you can actually do at home. You get, you know, uh, a very long thin channel, say maybe half a bamboo, and you make waves through it. And you'll find that the waves will propagate with speed according to their size, they'll come, they'll interact with each other, and then they will separate precisely back in the same waves that you have before. And so the box ball system is just a microscopic version of the KDV equation and these sol and these standing waves or solitary waves are known as solid the soliton solutions to the KDV equation. And essentially every solution to the KDV equation separates out into solitons. And so this gives us, you know, this this really is a microscopic version of the KDV equation. And so uh well, this is good. We can study this, and we can derive a number of uh, explicit formulas for this. But it turns out we can actually do something a little bit more. We can introduce a carrier to describe the dynamics. And what we do, well, rather than throwing the balls, I come, I walk along, and every time I see a ball, I pick it up. And every time I see a space, I drop it off. And let's assume I have a, a fairly large basket, more than the number of balls I would ever carry. So I can always pick up a ball and, I, and uh, progress like that. And this small change in perspective, it get, it's fairly easy to see you get the same dynamics. Uh, but you can model this by uh, basically quantum symmetries. So if I if I want to be very rigorous to uh, maybe the physicists in here, uh, I'm taking rep uh, represent finite dimensional representations of a quantum of a Drenfeld Jimbo quantum group. Uh, of affine type. Bunch of fancy words. Basically, I'm doing uh, quantum mechanics uh, and using stuff from quantum mechanics to understand how these waves move. And uh, this then allows us many uh, generalizations. Sorry, Leron, I'm writing that with an Z. <laughs> and I said Z. Um, so uh, because of these quantum symmetries, uh, I can change things around and do things like introduce uh, antiparticles and describe now how a variation of these waves move. And so uh, th this is all controlled by uh, 
something called R matrices. So if, if you know what an R matrix is, then you pretty much understand this statement. If you don't, well, I have vector spaces. I have maps that uh, preserve these uh, symmetries. And an R matrix is, is basically such a map, and it defines everything here. Um, I, I, to be really precise, I'm doing this at a combinatorial level. And it turns out it's just a bracketing rule. I pair things up, and things that are unpaired move into my carrier or out of my carrier, depending upon how things go. So I can actually, if I had more time, I could very, very easily describe how this procedure works. But um, it, you know, I've, I've more or less already told you. It's just, you know, picks up a ball when it can, drops it off when it uh, can. So um, we have lots and lots of, uh, th this actually gives us a huge amount of power. Uh, but there's also a relation with alignment of spins. So uh, if you think about uh, you know, particles and magnetic fields, basically there's two types of spins. Things point one way or they point the other way. And uh, if we chain these two choices together, well, th this is known as the spin chain, and then there's a bunch of physics involved. But just to keep things light, well, I had every position along for my box ball system had two states. It had a ball or it didn't have a ball. And that gives you the way to realize uh, with these spin chains. And the local energy, um, basically telling you about the interaction of two of the adjacent spins and, oh, okay, I need to fuse some of the spins together. But the local, but essentially the local energy coming from the, the physics turns out to be related to uh, the shifting of solitons from uh, the interaction. So, and this, this shift of positions uh, is a sign of the nonlinearity of the system. So just to give you uh, a brief kind of uh, example of what I mean by this, well, if I have two particles and then a particle like this, this jumps here, this jumps here, this jumps here. So here and here like this. And so this is my interaction. And I have this size two particle here, uh, size two soliton here, and the size one soliton here. And the size one soliton, if it was moving just by itself, would be at this position. And the size two soliton moving by itself would be at this position. But instead, they've shifted by uh, two from where they normally would be. And this is the nonlinearity. And this is controlled by uh, the inner, this local interaction in this, part, in this spin chain system. And so we get some very nice connections there. And there's still a lot of open questions uh, involved with this where uh, probably the, the biggest one is, well, how do we include supersymmetry into this? There are some very recent results that uh, have made some progress in this for one particular case, but Beyond that, uh, we have no idea, and in large part because the analog of the, the symmetries 
the quantum group and its representations, we don't really understand or even know about. And so, uh, you know, within this one seemingly very simple question, there's a lot that needs to be done and there'll be almost certainly a lot of very good mathematics and very good physics that will come from this. And kind of the other major open question is what happens when we make this system random? And so now in my last few minutes here, let me actually connect the two parts of my talk. Because right now, it seems like they've been completely separate from each other. But it's actually this R matrix here. This little tiny thing I'm glossed over. Well, it turns out that KSEP, you can describe it in a lot of very interesting cases by R matrices that satisfy a stochastic condition. In other words, there's a certain sum of the entries that's involved. And so every, the way we study all of these, at least that uh, those of us in this representation theory probabilistic area of mathematics is we use R matrices to do everything on, the, on TASEP. And then we have this, which has also been uh, the box ball system. But uh, very few people have done probabilistic versions of the box ball system. And usually, and some recent results in uh, combinatorics have shown that if I introduce an extra probabilistic parameter, I get a very interesting type of object that's related with other affine Lie algebras. Uh, you know, if, if I want to throw words around, I would say Hall Littlewood polynomials and Q Whitaker polynomials. But um, there, it turns out you get other extremely interesting objects uh, and with g uh, geometric connections. So, yeah, I think that's where I'll end my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Question I had earlier. Um, you had the at the end of your TASEP thing, you had kind of open questions or something, or like other directions, uh, current studies. There we go. Uh, on a ring. Um, is it TASEP or ASEP? Maybe one of those on a ring somehow relates to McDonald polynomials and some kind of symmetric functions. Is, does the same thing happen here on a line? Like, should I understand or be able to understand why symmetric? Come here besides partitions. Well, the so why you should expect symmetric functions is the 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 connection. It's the R matrix. Um, the and you have Yang Baxter equation, and Yang Baxter equation gives you the, the symmetric functions. Um, but you can't if you now allow particles to hop back with some additional independent parameter. That's ASAP, that's removing the totally part. And there's very recent results of Mandelstrom, Ayer, and Kurt, uh, Martin. Maybe Sylvia was involved, I forget, uh, for that. Um, that say that the stationary distribution is a McDonald polynomial, basically. And there's... Uh, uh, modified McDonald's by using TASERP, where now you change the model a little bit and you allow things to stack um, at each site and you break the, the, the exclusion process part, but not so badly that um, things become completely wild. So somehow, are you suggesting that like using this R matrix um, viewpoint on this, that it's... Uh... And basically just looking at this as something to do with the Lie algebra and therefore the symmetric function stuff should fall out more. Basically, yeah. Okay.
anyone else have any questions? If not, then let's thank Travis again. <laughs>